the windward side of the island is known for exciting places of interest. The rainforest, Little Tobago, and the Richmond Great House Inn and African Museum are site for this week. In the next half hour, I'll tell you why this property is important to Tobago. In the meantime, here's a look at what's to come. I'm Davia Chambers and this is Let's Talk Tobago. Tobago House of Assembly to phase out the use of polystyrene. Details on Habitat for Humanity courtesy call and later we take you to the primary school's agricultural prize giving function. These stories and more when Let's Talk Tobago continues. We'll be right back. And it is said, it's the land of tomorrow. Princess Margaret say, come to Vigo for holiday. Now the whole world say, come to Vigo for holiday. Richmond Great House was created in the late 18th century, making it the oldest surviving plantation house in Tobago. Fire, hurricanes and time destroyed many of the other original plantation houses on the island. Now, polystyrene products have negative effects on our health and the environment. That's why Tobago is making a move to eliminate its use and replace it with things that are environmentally friendly. Omidara Mills has more in this report. Take a look. You may know it by its brand name, Styrofoam. It's used for disposable packaging of food and that morning coffee, or even items such as furniture and televisions. More accurately though, it's known as expandable polystyrene. It's lightweight, relatively inexpensive, and for a long time has been the preferred packaging material for restaurants and fast food outlets. But polystyrene is also harmful to our health as well as the environment. That's why the Tobago House of Assembly passed a motion to phase out the use of polystyrene foam products on the island at its second plenary sitting. And the executive is moving quickly to establish a committee to oversee the process. The formation of a, a multi-stakeholder team, which would include, of course, members from the Tobago House of Assembly, the Department of Environment, Fisheries, Health, um, our environmental stakeholders, our business stakeholders, uh, youth representative and so on. So we expect that that multi-stakeholder team will do a couple of things and in the first instance they would have to provide an action plan for us um, for the way forward with phasing out polystyrene products and of course we expect this um, report within a month. Polystyrene is non-biodegradable. It takes hundreds of years for the material to decompose and can harm marine life when swallowed. In some U.S. cities, such as New York and San Francisco, the use of this material has been banned. It's the same in many other countries, such as France and Guyana. But what are the more eco-friendly alternatives if Tobago is to phase out the use of polystyrene? The hot cups that we have, which all of these products, by the way, are totally compostable, made of baggers. Um, totally compostable, so we don't even have to throw them into the, um, to the landfill, send them to the landfill. They can be composted. Though this looks like plastic, it's made entirely from bagasse, and it's 100% compostable, 100%. Um, the hot cups are actually cheaper than the normal styrofoam cups of this, um, of this size. The division is also working to create awareness about the alternatives a packaging exposition entitled, If It's Green, It's Good, will soon be hosted to highlight more sustainable options available on the market. Educational and sampling campaigns will also take place around the island. And we want to start doing almost sample days, so we're going to partner with some of the suppliers, the food suppliers, to see if they can sample some of the products. The multi-stakeholder committee will also look at the best way to handle other waste materials and the sustainable alternatives for those products. It's part of the efforts to ensure Tobago remains clean, green, safe and serene. I'm Amadara Mills for Let's Talk Tobago. 
Tobago was the last Caribbean island to experience the plantation system which comprised sugarcane and cocoa. Slaves brought in from West Africa worked on the plantations and the products made were exported to Europe for consumption. Now pay attention to this. Organizations are in the process of creating a system that will dispose of waste oil without harming the environment. Here are the details in this report. Waste oil from your vehicle and from industrial machinery used by manufacturing companies aren't always disposed of in ways that are environmentally friendly. But the Basel Convention Regional Center for Training and Technology Transfer for the Caribbean region and the Green Fund are collaborating to help Tobago tackle the issue. The main objective of this project is to put infrastructure on the ground that would allow a public private civil society partnership to manage waste lubricating oils in Tobago. Waste lubricating oils are those that come from the vehicles that we drive, from industrial equipment and plant and machinery, primarily those that are associated with the power generating sector, and with other industrial types of plant and equipment and machinery. The plan is to create infrastructure that will help the island dispose of waste oil without harming the environment. The pilot project is fully endorsed by the Tobago House of Assembly, as it will further promote the island's mantra of being clean, green, safe and serene. Indeed, we have been, we have been grappling with the issue of waste oil management for quite some time. And um, over the last few years, we would have um, had one or two initiatives and so on aimed at collecting and tran collecting, transporting and uh, recycling um, the waste oil. Not, not on the island itself, but um, um, in Trinidad through um, oil mop environmental services. When disposed of in the open environment, waste oil contaminates our waterways, soils and coastal areas. The project, which will result in a comprehensive disposal plan, is being financed by the Green Fund, a unit of the Ministry of Planning and Development. It seeks to understand the current waste oil management in Trinidad and Tobago. Waste, how, much, how much oil is generated? How is it disposed? It looks at developing policy and legislative inputs to help with the management of waste oils. It looks at bringing new technology and innovation into the area of waste oil management by developing a demonstration facility with technology for refining waste oils. The pilot project costs more than three and a half million dollars. The first component, which included a background study, has been completed. Component two, policy and system development, as well as market analysis, will be finished in the next four months. The final component should be ready by December. It includes a business plan, preparing documents for the supply and operation of the plant, training and preparing expressions of interest for the operation of the plant. I'm Keyshawn Wilson for Let's Talk Tobago. Slavery started in Tobago in the late 1760s but was abolished between 1834 and 1838. After the abolition, slaves were required to leave the plantation and arrangements were made for them to purchase and settle on lands outside of the estates. Now someone once said a goal without a plan is just a wish. Running an organization is difficult without a plan of action. That's why in this next story, we tell you the plans of the Division of Food Production, Forestry and Fisheries. Listen up. We all need food to survive. So food security for Tobago is the top priority for the Division of Food Production and Fisheries. Hayden Spencer, the Food Production Secretary says, there's a number of initiatives that can contribute to ensuring Tobago can produce enough food for its population in the coming years. We have the uh, Boko Training Center, which we will make a fisheries training center, which we will make an extra effort to have that fisheries training center up and running to carry out the necessary training program for our fisher folks. Also, we will have at Kendall, the Kendall Farm School, where we do that YAPA program. We are looking at revisiting that YAPA program, 
intensifying and upgrading that program at the Kendall Farm School so that we could have what we have, a cadre of not only just farmers, but trained farmers, trained young farmers on the island to develop the sector. The secretary also wants to revisit several industries that he believes can help boost production as well as exports. We will revisit our coconut and our cocoa industries, develop these areas, actually making the linkages to tourism and food nutrition. We will be seeking to collaborate with our agro-processors, the Agriculture Society, the All Tobago Fisher Folks Associations, and the Fish Processors Association, so that we can collaborate and work as a team to develop that initiative and to create an intensified food and agriculture sector in Tobago. The division is also in charge of managing the island's wildlife. I am appealing now to the population that this is the opportunity to give our wildlife the opportunity to reproduce. And therefore, we should cease from hunting during this closed period. The secretary is urging hunters to obey the country's law. Transforming food production on the island will also aid Tobago's economic diversification efforts. This means a better quality of life for everyone on the island. I'm Crystal George for Let's Talk Tobago. Did you know that Tobago switched from sugarcane to cocoa as its main export crop in the 1880s? Stay tuned. Let's Talk Tobago will be right back. Today, Richmond Great House is owned by Tobagonian Hollis Lynch, a professor of African history in New York City. He purchased the property in 1973 and created the art museum using artifacts from his many trips to Africa. Now, it's never easy getting the finances to construct a home. That's why two organizations are coming together to help low-income families in Tobago get a much-needed start. Let's take a look. Habitat for Humanity has built several homes in Trinidad. In 2016, they served 16 families. But they haven't had much of a presence in Tobago. That's about to change, though, as the organization met with Chief Secretary Calvin Charles and a team from the Assembly to discuss how they can lend support to the island's residents. We have concentrated on Trinidad quite a bit, and I think it's time that we put our attention in Tobago, especially as it relates to housing and human settlements especially as it relates to disaster preparedness. Habitat for Humanity also treats with disaster reduction. They have brought this program to Tobago where they have started a project to build at least eight retaining walls in Moriah. Number two is a little behind. It's taken a little time to complete. And number three, which just started last Monday, I'm being told by my staff, it's almost completed. An international team of 12, students from the Austin P State University as well as their two tutors were here for one week in Tobago. They were building the walls, putting up the walls, the steel, pouring the columns. And then you had 13 members of the community just stop by and said, listen, put my name down, I want to support. And they just came in and threw in their sweat. The organization really wants to help families in need of housing. The average habitat house in Trinidad and Tobago measures 27 by 21 square feet. Monthly mortgage payments over a 30-year period average $600. This is more affordable than the average rent in the local real estate market, allowing low-income families a chance at affording a comfortable home. Chief Sec seems very amenable to supporting Habitat. The other secretaries that were there seems very willing to extend their arms, community and settlements on how we can really bring together the communities of Tobago to address the whole issue of poverty housing and really providing decent shelter for low-income families. Habitat for Humanity will be working alongside the Division of Community Development, Enterprise Development and Labor, 
as well as the Division of Settlements, Urban Renewal and Public Utilities to meet their goals. I'm Caroline Wallace for Let's Talk Tobago. The guest annex is located at the back of the main house. In the colonial days, it served as a servant's quarters. It was refurbished in 1998 and it today has three guest units to accommodate short stays. Now come with me as I tell you about the development of the Buku Goat and Crab Race in Tobago. This is part of our segment called Footnotes, where we look at development through the years, the highs and the lows, the milestones and memorable moments since 1980 when the new Tobago House of Assembly was formed. Here's this week's Footnotes. Easter is a special occasion in Tobago, but it's not all about the holiday. It's also what comes just after, the Buku Goat and Crab Race Festival. After its inception in 1925, it was known as the Goat Race Festival. The event has since evolved as one of the island's biggest and most well-known festivals, drawing local fans and international spectators alike. The festival was started by Samuel Callender, who sought to create an event similar to thoroughbred horse racing which was once popular on the island. To date, the Buku Goat and Crab Race Festival is the only event of its kind in the Caribbean. The races were held on Chance Street in Buku, but now make their home at the Buku Integrated Facility. The festival is held on the Tuesday after Easter that's become known as Easter Tuesday. This year, the event is set for April 18th. The day starts with a street parade as families, friends and visitors chip through the streets to the pulsating music of drums and steel pan. You can visit booths where t-shirts are sold and enjoy local food and drinks. Since its re-establishment, the Tobago House of Assembly has thrown its support behind one of Tobago's signature heritage events. Every year, the Division of Tourism, Culture and Transportation helps facilitate the festival with support from other sponsors. The Buku residents are hands-on in organizing the event and managing the races and activities. But it's not just a cultural celebration. The festival has claimed a prominent position on Tobago's events calendar. This is a major, unique tourism event. And um, as I said, you know, it, it, it is one of those products, tourism products, that we have to continue to bolster and build. And, and make really, you know, as, as one of the pivotal, um, iconic events to Tobago. A lot of preparation goes into the festival. It requires racing goats that are strong and fast. It also takes teamwork among the owners, trainers and jockeys to get the competitors ready for this battle for bragging rights. It takes time and dedication, all right? You need um, the right feed, long walks, swim, uh, restruck exercise, all right, and um, well, visiting the vet. The exercising starts early in the morning, roughly at around four o'clock. By six o'clock, I'm finished training. My prior to a month or two before the goat race. Now, in its 92nd year, the festival's longevity is being attributed to the dedication of the Buku community. The Goat Race Festival brings families together. Even visitors attending get caught up in the festive atmosphere, becoming honorary Tobagonians for a day. It's a symbol of community spirit that's apparent in many other Tobago-based events. After the goats have had their time on the track, the eyes turn to the crab races. Blue crabs are persuaded to make their way out of the circle. This race stirs up a bit of excitement. The Buku Goat and Crab Race Festival is a significant contributor to tourism, culture and community development in Tobago. And with the continued support of the Tourism Division, it will remain a staple for the coming generations to enjoy. I'm Kuni Freitas for Let's Talk Tobago. In 1956, British actress Deborah Kerr, who starred in Heaven Knows Allison, spent a weekend at Richmond. It's time to take a break, but when we return, we take you to the primary school's agricultural prize-giving function. Don't go anywhere. Let's talk Tobago. We'll be right back. Stay with us.
After a brief renovation period, Richmond Great House started receiving favorable attention from magazines like American Way in 1992, television features like Lonely Planet in 1999, which focused on Tobago, and prestigious newspapers like the New York Times in 1994. Grow what you eat and eat what you grow. Students from various primary schools on the island participated in an agricultural competition and a presentation function was hosted to announce the winner. Kearney Freitas has more. Grow what you eat and eat what you grow. That was the message and the theme behind the 2016 Agricultural Science Competition hosted for primary school students across Tobago. The students learned about various species of plants and animals. The program is helping the island to enhance its agricultural industry by increasing interest in and educating the future generation. The division was pleased to be part of the 2016 Annual Primary Schools Agricultural Science Competition. Our role as a division is to facilitate the agricultural process for stakeholders throughout Tobago with the hope that our input would redound to an overall strong and thriving industry and better and improved standards of living for various stakeholders. The competition is also an avenue for strengthening food security. This is why the division lent its support to the participating schools. In the 2016 annual primary schools agricultural science competition, we facilitated the process by one, providing seedlings, other, other planting materials, and livestock at a cheaper cost. Emphasis here on cheaper. Two, some schools were able to benefit from tractor services. Three, technical advice from our extension officers were given to schools. More than 10 primary schools competed for the top prize. Moriah Government Primary School emerged winners. With Pembroke Anglican Primary School in second place, Third spot went to Wim Anglican Primary, while Speyside Anglican was fourth and Black Rock Government fifth. The competition also had a few other key benefits for the students. It allows you an opportunity to be engaged physically as you tend to your plants. And it allows you also an opportunity to learn a little more of the importance of agricultural science. Understanding the seasonality of some crops. The agricultural science competition was judged by the extension officers attached to the Division of Food Production and Fisheries. I'm Kern De Freitas for Let's Talk Tobago. Richmond Great House would reopen soon for tours and vacation bookings. To keep guests occupied, there's a pool, a tennis court, a museum, and a library. Management wants you to know that events from small weddings to reunions are also facilitated here on the property. Live, breathe, Dance. Dance Ensemble hosted a presentation function to recognize the accomplishments of their members. Have a look at this story. The sphere of dance in Tobago is changing. A new generation of dancers are showing that Tobagonians have an abundance of talent. They're part of the Dance Ensemble group, students who recently celebrated success in their dance examinations. They took the opportunity to show off what they learned during an award presentation function at the Signal Hill Secondary School. Their performances are an indication that dance in Tobago has developed tremendously. Back then, all we knew was just the rhythm and the conch. For the walls was one, two, three, four, five, six. For the quick step, the rhythm we knew was slow, slow, quick, quick. Slow, quick, quick, slow. Quick, quick, slow, slow. For the rumba, we had a count. Four, one, two, three. Four, one, two, three. And if we knew then what you know now, I would tell you that we would not have done that those exams at that time at all. The theme of the awards function was SPICE. Candidates were recognized for their outstanding performances in various categories, from the social dance division to as high as the gold bar too. Modern dance candidates are now much more focused on technique, poise, and style, and they're excelling in their exams. 
candidates are now aware of the technique, footwork, alignment, poise, style, and candidates are so aware that they are now vying for honors in these examinations. No longer are they satisfied with just passing the exams. As a matter of fact, 30% of the candidates this year in their sittings acquired honors. During the function, the crowd had a taste of what the young students learned. The students were also happy to show off their new skills. Dance ensemble members meet on Saturdays for practice and encourage others who would like to perform to join their group. The group isn't just about dancing though, they also host social events. Quite apart from the dance, we also engage in other, other social activities. We have our sports and family day, we have various socials that we have and we participate from time to time to various competitions in Trinidad. Dance Ensemble participated in the Tobago Dance Sports Championships in 2014 and the 2016 Caribbean Regional Dance Classic. I'm Kern De Freitas for Let's Talk Tobago. And it's time to have your say, the segment of our program where we hear what you, the viewers, have to say. Today we're asking, what is your suggestion for replacing the inter-island cargo ferry? Here's what you had to say. Instead of spending all our millions in to invest in the old one, you should get your own, build a new boat and done with that. Yeah, I think they should buy two new boats and, and that will solve the problem, you know what I'm saying? Because buying a um, used boat, I think that's more problem, you know what I'm saying? So I'd say just as the, the fast ferries, uh, we had them leased and then we purchased them and we have them as our own. I think the same should go for the cargo vessel also. Be Purchase a new vessel so that our business people can be able to have their goods come to them and not be troubled because right now business people are troubled. I agree with them when they said concerning the bridge that they wanted to put from Tobago to Trinidad, a bridge so they'll be able to have everybody come from, I think it's from Toko, they'll be able to have a bridge and be able to transport vehicles that way. We're seeing that Tobago depend on the entire island ferry for most or if not all of its goods and material. I think it is imperative that we get a brand new ferry. They have to source the money somewhere somehow, get a brand new ferry so that we could, because if we don't have that fa fast ferry, how are we in Tobago going to survive? Trinidad and Tobago should look into purchasing their own vessels. Leasing is okay, but I think if you add up the cost, sometimes when something is yours and you have ownership of it, it's easier to manage as opposed to a company just pulling out two weeks before and just giving you that short deadline to work with. Prime Minister Trinidad and Tobago should get new stuff because it doesn't make no sense you renting something that breaking down every minute. It brings pressure on Trinidad and Tobago itself. We close another edition of Let's Talk Tobago and as always, we thank you for watching. Please email us with your comments or queries about the program and be sure to visit our website, like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. From our house to yours, I'm Davia Chambers along with the Department of Information, Office of the Chief Secretary, Tobago House of Assembly, wishing you a safe and very productive week. We close now with a montage of the Shouter Baptist Celebrations 2017. Do enjoy.